I need to subscribe. Oh, stop talking because we're recording. Okay. Hey. What I want to do today, guys, is uh, cover some of the states of matter that uh, was really not organized well in this chapter. But when I teach physical science and my basic chemistry class, we go through this. So I want to show you some of the things you need to know about the difference between solid, liquid, gas, as well as three of the other states of matter, and explain that. So for those of you absent today, this is for you, okay, as well as these guys here. Okay, so let's start in the middle of our chart here. We've been talking the last couple of days predominantly about gases. And remember, gas, gases have two, two variables here, shape and volume. Gases have the unique characteristics of being able to change their shape. If I fill up a balloon with a gas, guess what? We can squeeze it, we can turn it into a fake sword, we can turn it into a little dog, we can turn it into a hat for a kid to wear. And you've seen that done at parties and at uh, fairs where they take balloons and make all kinds of cool shapes. Variable shape, very useful. Variable volume means we can compress them into things like a scuba tank or a can of whipped cream or a uh, syringe where we squeeze the, the gas called air into a smaller volume. Okay, Compressibility is related to volume, so it just means can I compress or squeeze that substance into a smaller volume. Now what are the atoms doing in gas? We talked about this. They're doing that elastic collision where they don't lose any energy and they're traveling very fast. We would call the temperature of gases high and that's just a relative term in relationship to the other states of matter here. Compared to liquids or gases, liquids have still have a variable shape. Remember I can take these, I can pour them into a container, uh, we can pour them into a bucket, we can pour them into a jug, we can pour them into a water uh, glass, we can pour them into a tray. They're going to take the shape of whatever container we put them in, but no longer can we squeeze them. And remember yesterday or the day before we put some water in here, we tried to squeeze it, all of a sudden water is not squeezable. We can't squeeze it into a smaller volume. Air, yes. Water or a liquid, no. So this is not compressible and it is a fixed volume. Water is always going to have a fixed volume. What do the atoms do in a liquid that's different than in a gas? They slip and they slide past each other. So we can swim through them. Yay. We can pour them down our throat. Blub, 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 blub. And they go down our throat. We can um, watch them form puddles. Um, but they slip and they slide. They're still close enough that they can't be compressed. But they're easy enough to move around that we can stir them. They flow. We have waterfalls and beautiful things that happen on Earth because of the flowability of water. Waves at the ocean. All of these because they slip and they slide loosely to each other. The temperature, just again a relative term, would be medium compared to a high temperature for a gas. So I take energy away from a gas, I get a liquid. I add energy to a liquid, I get a gas. The third state of matter we've talked about a little bit this week is the solids. And we'll cover some more of this in the next day or two. Solids have a fixed shape. No longer can I bend them or squeeze it into a container, okay? If, it, if, it, if it's got a fixed shape, it's a solid, which is why peanut butter really isn't a solid. Because we can squeeze it. Toothpaste is not a solid either, technically, because I can squeeze it, change its shape. And there's a fine line, a gray area between solids and liquids, but um, if it has a fixed shape and a fixed volume, can't squeeze it, can't bend it, can't change its shape, it's usually a solid. Okay, so non-compressible. What do we know about the atoms in the solid? They are locked in place, but they're still vibrating, they're still jiggling, they're still wiggling, if you want to think of that. I use the word vibrate here. Most of the time, solids are going to be called something called a crystalline structure. Now, I brought with me today, um, this is my specs. These are 512 little mini magnets into this cool shape here. You can do all kinds of cool things with this. I'm not going to pass it around because I'm just going to squish it. It mm -hmm. takes me about half an hour to get it back into the shape here. Um, but specs are fun. You can see that they're lined up in rows and columns because of their magnetism. But atoms do the same thing in solids. They line up in rows and columns. We call those crystals. 
Okay, crystalline solid is something where the atoms have a very rigid structure. Again, they're still each one's vibrating like a, something on a spring, but they they're not free to move around. We can cut them. If I take a saw and cut this, or if I take the, my little cutting blade here, which is plastic, you know, I can cut this. I can chop a, a section off. Whoa. And make this do all kinds of cool things. Okay. Um, and we can cut solids, but they still stay stuck together. They're still in a rigid crystalline structure. Okay, so solids we would call a low temperature. How do I change from a, a solid to a liquid? We did it in the lab yesterday. We add energy, add heat, add kinetic energy to those particles. How do we change back from a liquid to a solid? We take energy away. We replace the hot water with the cold water. And we saw almost within a couple minutes, boom, back to solid state. OK, now outside of this range are things that you and I don't experience in normal everyday life. So we don't talk about them a lot. Many of you may be familiar with the word plasma. Now this is completely unrelated to the word plasma if we're talking about blood. OK, that's a different kind of plasma. This is a plasma where if I take a gas and keep heating it up from hundreds or thousands of a degree to millions of degrees, I can get something where the electrons literally have so much energy that they burst free. So the key characteristic of a plasma is loose electrons. The little star next to that, I say, what, which state of matter has loose electrons? That's your keyword for plasma. Now, plasmas do occur here on Earth in everyday life, but they're kind of rare. So, the first example. Does anybody know of one, by the way? Plasma? Okay, let's talk about a lightning bolt. Oops, where'd it go? Okay, I went the wrong direction. Plasma. Where are you? There we go. Lightning bolt. What is a lightning bolt? Lightning bolt literally has so much energy and reaches such a high temperature that it rips the electrons off of the oxygen and nitrogen as it slices through the atmosphere of Earth. And that produces a very small amount of plasma. Some people can claim to smell it because they smell that electrical smell of those electrons. Um, and a lightning bolt uh, is extremely hot. You've seen it can start forest fires. It can melt glass. Um, it's been seen to do all kinds of crazy things because of the temperatures that lightning bolts have. The area of effect is extremely small. Within a couple atoms of that lightning bolt happening is where those temperatures occur, but it is extremely hot, extremely deadly. Another case where we see plasma on Earth is something called a neon light. Neon, of course, we know as a noble gas. But a neon light, like you see, go to the hotel down on um, 65 Bypass, and you see all the signs that say vacancy or no vacancy, right? Mm -hmm. Always outside. And what is inside those tubes of orange light is neon. And what they do is they zap it with some electricity at high voltage, and it basically becomes a mini lightning bolt, OK? It loosens up the electrons from the neon and it gives off light as those electrons go back to the neon. So it's constantly ripping the electrons away, letting the electrons go back to their state, and it gives off that really cool orange-red color that we see, classic of a neon sign. Okay, so the neon sign is a classic example, and to a lesser degree, um, these lights here that we call fluorescent lights are also do the same type of thing, but not at the temperatures or the amount of energy that we talked about here. The third place on Earth that we see an example of plasmas is something called the Northern Lights. Who knows the official name for the Northern Lights? Good, Aurora Borealis. How about in the Southern Hemisphere? They have a different name. Nope, Aurora Australis, named after Australia. And if you could get the lights, Riley, for me just real quick, um, to show you about a minute of the Northern Lights. What's going on here is in the atmosphere, we have the interaction between the sun's solar wind, which is a series of atoms running into the elect uh, electromagnetic field around the Earth. And when it rips the electrons off of those atoms, 
off these beautiful lights. You can see them in the northern parts of Canada, Alaska, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Russia, Iceland, Greenland, and even in the southern hemisphere in Antarctica and the southern parts of Australia. A lot of people think this is why the Norse mythologies of gods came into being because they saw these lights in the sky and saw things that looked like cities or maybe they had an imagination and thought there was things going on in the realm of the gods. For instance, today we know it's plasma. So the state of matter known as plasma, beautiful colors in the sky. Literally it's just atoms with their electrons ripped loose. Thank you. I could watch that for a long time. Very, 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 very beautiful sky lit lights. I've never seen them in real life though. Okay, um, the fourth example of plasma, and I want you to know these examples. These are questions that I might ask on the next test. Anything from this chart is free game. So we have neon lights, we have aurora borealis, we have lightning bolts, and the fourth one is not on Earth, but it is in our sun. So the sun itself is a giant ball of plasma. You say, I thought it was made up of hydrogen and helium. It's 90% hydrogen and about 10% helium, but that's really got its electrons knocked loose, okay? Because the temperatures are so extreme in the sun that those electrons are free to zip around. There's a giant storm going on in the sun. If you look at it with certain filters, you can see the, the solar flares and the solar storms going on. And those are the electrons interacting with the electromagnetic field of the sun, all kinds of crazy stuff going on. But the sun literally is a giant ball of plasma, not gas. And because of that, guess what? 99% of the universe is made up of plasma. So that's a cool trivia question. Somebody ever asked you, hey, which state of matter makes up most of the universe? Is it solid, liquid, or gas? It's none, none of the above. It's plasma because every star in the universe is plasma ball, and 99% of the matter in the universe is made up of the stars that we see in the sky at night. Cool, or really hot. Okay, so let's talk about the two at the bottom and the top. So these are arranged in order of energy. So what happens if I take something and start cooling it off, like way below zero? Um, I'll get a solid, but eventually I'll reach a point where something weird happens. And this happens at temperatures, as you see over here, near absolute zero. We're talking like less than a couple degrees Kelvin. Two, three, four degrees Kelvin, near absolute zero. And matter does different things when it gets that cold. There's so little energy that these atoms do different behaviors. It was originally uh, predicted by Einstein, the famous physicist in the 1920s, and another scientist by the name of Bose in the 1950s or 60s, and within the last 15 years was proven to exist, as we on Earth have been able to get temperatures down below one Kelvin. Um, and what this Einstein, Bose-Einstein condensate, sometimes called a BE condensate, it actually does, is it makes a really cool fluid almost like a liquid, it's not. But it has two characteristics. Number one, it is a superfluid, which means, guess what? About zero friction, okay? So we know that every piece of matter has friction. Even a gas has friction. Liquids have friction, it's called viscosity. Solids have friction, we measure it in physics. is something that scientists are excited about exploring because it has the possibility of making things move much more efficiently with no loss of friction forces. And then superconductivity has to do with electricity being conducted with almost zero resistance. And at those temperatures, again, um, weird things happen and we start reaching the realm where um, these properties are going to prove really, really useful in the future as far as electronics and how to make electronics work more efficiently without losing any heat, which is basically what happens when you have electricity flow through a wire, you lose some heat, 
some energy due to heat, the electrons slow down. Okay, Bose-Einstein condensate, I need to know two things about it. Superfluid, superconductor, super cold. Okay, superfluid, superconductor, super cold. And that's what you need to know about those. What happens if we heat things up to trillions of degrees? And again, this is something that's been accomplished in the last 15 years here on Earth. Okay? And we actually get a new state of matter, which is no longer like a plasma, because instead of just ripping the electrons apart, we take the, the parts that are in the nucleus. So your nucleus, your protons and your neutrons, are actually made up of tinier particles called quarks. Most of you have probably heard of them before. There's the up, down, up quark, down quark, strange quark, charm quark, top quark, and bottom quark, six types. Okay? And quarks make up all protons and neutrons and about a hundred other types of particles called baryons. It's not at named after me, by the way. Um, and quarks and the glue that holds them together is called gluons. Imagine that. Okay? So quarks and gluons start to break apart. When protons and neutrons break apart into these substances and form a giant mush. I call it a mash here. Like mashed potatoes is mashed up potatoes. Or porridge or oatmeal is mashed up oats. Or your favorite down here in the south, grits, mm -hmm. mashed up corn, I think. That's what somebody explained it to me as. Okay, but what is it? It's a giant mash of quarks and gluons. It's no longer matter as we know it. It is no longer protons and neutrons. It's no longer a nucleus and electrons. It's just a giant pile of stuff. Okay? And all you need to know about it is it's very, 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 very hot. And it is a mash of quarks and gluons. Hence the name quark-gluon plasma. That's it. Okay? So anything on here, if there's an empty spot, you don't need to know it. Um, I want you to study this over the weekend or review it maybe once a day for the next couple of days. You'll see some of these questions on your test next week for chapter 12. Because it has to do with energy and just a little bit more than what you'd usually get in a chemistry class in high school. But it's new stuff that's been discovered in the last 15 years and eventually will make its way into textbooks. Good? Can you believe it? Oh, you've got 10 minutes before you. Okay, put that away. We're going to take a quiz. Lee, David, David, Lee. David, Lee. I don't want to write it. David, Lee. 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 Yes. David, Ryan. David, if I was Ryan, anything.